Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome. Uh, this is the, uh, the true remnant of the brave and faithful souls who make it to church twice in the same week. <laughs> and even uh, two days after Christmas to boot. So I think y'all will be glad you came this morning. Uh, we're going to worship God by singing and reading his word. And um, we're going to hear from a few of our young adults about living out their faith and defending it after high school. So I'm glad you're here anyway. Um, let's pray as we get started. Blessed Father, uh, help us as we come into your presence by your Spirit uh, to see the vision of you, to lay aside anything that would uh, distract us from hearing your word and from offering you ourselves and our worship. Help us to focus on being in your presence. And uh, we're here to give you thanks and praise and honor you. And we ask that you would open us to your word, help us to hear Jesus' promises and Teach us to believe in him as our only Lord and Savior. Help us to grow in faith and faithfulness. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. We continue in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God. Let us sing. Let us stand and sing. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, oceans cry out to you. Mountains they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise.
your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, O oh God Your grace is enough seated for the reading of the word. Today's readings are in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7, where Paul writes, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who are slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. And from Colossians 3, 12 through 17, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
seated while I lower the mic. Awesome. We say this every week because it's true every week. Everything we have has come from him and we give him only what he first gave us. Good morning. We have a lot to be thankful for. Happy to see you. Worship was great. Thank you. Music was fantastic. Okay. Welcome would be appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks. To be able to worship with you, my family, and to love you in, in peace and uh, rest is really good. It's really good. This is the time when those of us who call New Church home give back a portion of what God has given us. We believe everything that we have comes from God. He's blessed us so that we can bless others. Your faithful giving is what makes it possible for New Church to continue doing this ministry. Thank you. Now, the first parts of our offering this week are going to go to the Pregnancy Help Center, local ministry with programs to help people who are faced with unplanned pregnancy. Let's pray over this offering. Father, thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the, the week that we've had. 
Father, pray for those who've suffered loss, that you'd give them peace, and, and that we would find that, in fact, yes, your grace is enough. Lord, for the many blessings we've received, we know that they've come from you, and they're only because of you. And so we give back now a portion of what that is as our act of worship. We pray that you'd bless these tithes and offerings so that they would be enough. Amen. Uh, again, if you want to give from your computer or smart ch- smartphone, you can go to newchurch.love forward slash give, or you can give by text by texting the word give to 832-400-5299, 832-400-5299. Robert Stanley, those were not pictures of me and my family on Christmas Eve. Thank you for asking. Thank you. The, the first time that you... He sent me a text. I said, is that really you and your family? Got to wonder. I've got some somewhere. If you're a guest in person or online, let us know that you're here and how we can be praying for you. Uh, you can fill out a digital guest, ch- guest card at newchurch.love forward slash info. We are going to have, are we having young ones today, Miss Holly? Yes, that's a yes, and she's certain about it. So it's now time for young ones, if you'll go with Miss Holly, and now I'll turn it back to Kemper for sanity and context. I don't know about the sanity and context business. Um, so at New Church, one of the things we talked about from the beginning is um, my experience has been that most high school kids, um, when they hit college, they fold like a deck of cards about Christianity. If they don't, if they've not been taught some sort of context or some kind of reality that the Bible itself makes all sorts of intellectual sense and is not only easy to defend, but it's easy to, as Paul says, demolish other arguments. So for a while now, we've had, uh, we've had not only in our personal encounters uh, with the kids that we have that go on, but Ryan Bersinger teaches a class on apologetics that he has for a while. And uh, so what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to hear from four of our kids who are no longer in high school but are now in college or in some cases in the military stuff. And we're going to hear about um, how they've lived out their faith and defended their faith in those contexts. So, uh, So here it goes. You might not know this about me, but I love to paint. Gorgeous paintings are often incredibly complex. To get that complexity and beauty, it has to have both lights and darks. It can't be all bright and pretty. It has to have dark places as well. Life is the same. It has to have all kinds of complex elements before it can be made into something worthwhile. I have left home and made some bold strokes over the last few months. My parents have taken a step back to let me hold the paintbrush and even make some mistakes, always staying nearby in case I needed to ask questions or advice. Dad, did I make the nose too big? As I paint the nose from the top of the head to bottom of the chin, he answers, maybe a smidge. Mom, did I make the eyes too small? And she's like, oh, are those little specks eyes? And then everyone asks, how's school going? And I give the highlights. I've made some friends and I'm doing well in school. But the highlights don't really tell the story. They aren't going to be the parts that really test my faith. Instead, it's going to be the times I don't have all the answers. Concordia is a Christian school, but there are still a lot of unbelievers and atheists who go there, which has led to many conversations where people ask about what I believe. I've had a lot of good conversations where I get to share my faith with unbelievers. Many times, though, I don't really have the answers, or my doubts are revealed, but I've learned to answer honestly, that I don't know the answers. This is usually followed by a call to mom or dad, asking more questions until I can wrap my mind around what they're saying, not just following my parents blindly, but seeing if their answers hold up from different angles making the faith I learned from them my own. Like my dad always says, 
it's important to know the difference between a doubt and a question. Questions are looking for answers. Doubts are just looking for a fight. The only way to answer a doubt is with a doubt. For example, what if God doesn't exist? Well, what if he does? Facing questions and doubts in college and throughout the rest of my life, that's what faith is for. So I can take comfort in that. And I believe that no matter what, God is creating a beautiful, complex piece of art through me that is eventually going to end up being something good. The thought of moving away from home had always seemed too scary and surreal for me to ever consider it a reality. I knew I wanted to go to Abilene Christian University, but I thought it would be impossible to move six hours away and not see my friends and family for so long, especially with my past of anxiety. However, I feel like God was calling me there and making a way for me, so despite all my anxiety, I decided to go. I remember thinking, I'm absolutely crazy for doing this. If God can help me actually accomplish this, then I guess he really can do anything. And not only did he help me just get through, he helped me thrive there. I loved it. And I feel like I've been learning to trust him more for that very reason. The saying, where God guides, he provides, has been the truth I've been holding on to this semester. And he has provided for me, spiritually, financially, and in many other ways. I'm also learning what it means to rely on Christ as my source of sustainment. Because I am outside of my comfort zone and what I've been used to my whole life, I can't rely on comforts like familiar surroundings and routines like I used to. Instead, I've had to really think about what it means to rely on Him in all I do. I've had to switch from thinking about my ever-changing surroundings as my solid ground to Him who holds all reality together. Similarly, I've realized that I really can't succeed in anything at all without him and his guidance. Overall, this semester has led me to put my faith into action and has taught me that despite all my fears, God is not only in control, but is actively working in my life to accomplish his good and sovereign purposes for me. Howdy. How are we doing? Nice. So um, they told us to write about um, our Christian life after we left. And I wrote one, but I didn't really think it was genuine. Um, I was kind of vague about like what life in the army is like as a Christian. So, And then uh, there was a Christmas Eve, and they said I was going to talk about story about my friends with the Bibles and everything, so I'm going to tell one story. Um, it's about my best friend, Austin. When I first met Austin, he was an atheist, and we met at MEPS. Um, he didn't have a whole lot of faith in God. In fact, he didn't really see a point in there being a God. He had lived a rough life, uh, and he had, had plenty of reasons why he shouldn't believe, right? But... At one point, there was a morning where I was reading uh, my Bible after our morning chow. And he came up to me and he was like, why do you read your Bible every day? And I didn't really have an answer for him. I told him that I made a promise to my mom. <laughs> and it's true, it's true. I made a promise to my mom that I'd read a, at least one proverb every day. So that's what I was trying to stay true to. I don't really like going back on my word. And he looked at me kind of funny. He was like, now that you think about it, every time you said you were going to do something, you did it. He was like, you don't really lie. And I, was, I didn't have like words for him. I was kind of just like, well, that's how I was raised. Do what you say you're going to do. And don't go back on your word. And... He kind of looked at me funny, and uh, he dismissed it. He walked away that day, and uh, a couple of days later, uh, he came up to me while I was reading, and he, was, he asked me if I could read to him whenever I read my Bible. I was like, well, yeah, sure. I mean, it's not a big deal. And he looked at me, and he said, well, I won't lie. I'm not the smartest individual, so if you could kind of explain what you're reading, that would help me out a lot. 
So I said, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, I ended up reading, um, I want to say it was Proverbs 18 that day. Uh, I couldn't really tell you <laughs> what what we had talked about, but I, I was kind of just reading, and he, he would stop me every once in a while and ask questions like, hey, why, why is it worded this way? Or, hey, how come in the Bible it says it like this when I've been told this my whole life? And I just looked at him, and I was like, well, I can't tell you what you've been told your whole life. I can't really tell you what you were taught, but... This is how the word affects me. This is um, this is how it changed my life. And I ended up telling him a little bit about my testimony, about how how I came to Jesus, and about how it ended up changing my family life entirely. And uh, he looked at me and he was like, "Well, my stepdad was in prison, and before I left, he was back, and he was the one that raised me, right?" And he said he hated his, his stepdad. But a couple months before he left, his stepdad ended up meeting Jesus. And he was completely different. And, and he, he looked at me and he was like, well, I'm not going to lie. He, he wanted to say that it was all fake and it was just for show. And I got to talk to him about the story in my family, how my dad completely changed. And I got to tell him about how uh, after that moment, our, our whole family structure kind of, like, it made a 180. Our whole family started moving together, and we started being more united and just an actual family. And he looked at me, and he was like, you know what? Um, I don't know how to walk this out. I don't know how to um, do this on my own. And you're, only, you're the only person in my life that I can look at and talk to about these things. And it was at that point he asked me um, if he thought there was a place in, like with God, with him. I told him, yeah, absolutely. I told him that, uh, you know, I, I can't make the decision for him. I told him that uh, his walk has to be his own, but I'd be with him every step of the way. I'd do whatever I can to help him. And it was at that point, uh, <laughs> It was at that point we were in a spot where we were getting separated because there were people that got uh, caught up with COVID. And he was one of the people that popped positive. So we were, in the, we were gonna end up uh, getting shipped out at two different times. So I was like, you know what? Uh, like literally five minutes before we left, I put my Bible in his bag and he looked at me and he was like, no, I can't take your Bible. He was like, you, you've told me so much about how it means to you. He was like, I can't do it. But I put it in his hand, and I told him, I was like, man, if this is the last time I get to see you, I'd rather give you something that can stay with you forever. And uh, it was at that point, we ended up getting uh, sent to the same spot. <laughs> so uh, he looked at me, and he was like, uh, you can have this back. <laughs> we ended up reading to we ended I ended up reading to him every day and uh, he would come up to me with questions and we'd bounce off each other for two month time period we were at reception I told him I was like you know what when I go back and when we go back to Texas I'm going to get you a Bible and he was like absolutely he was like whatever you get me I'm going to keep it and he was like yeah, I'm going to tell you about what I'm reading all the time and it was at that point we ended up going to a place, it was called the PX. It's kind of like a mini Walmart. Uh, it's for on base kind of stuff. And there ended up being some like little mini, mini Bibles there, right? Just New Testament, Pro Psalms, Proverbs. So I gave, I ended up buying him one. And I was like, it's, it's not the full thing, but this is what I can give you. And so, uh, Every day since that day, he's been talking to me about what he's been reading. He's been uh, telling me about how things have changed and how he he doesn't know how to do it, but he's going to make it work. And it's just, it's awesome. So I've been staying in touch with him, and he's doing real good. He, he ended up uh, proposing to his uh, girlfriend, so that's awesome. I'm going to be the best man at his wedding. Yeah. All right. That's, uh, that's all I have, but uh, thank you all.
good morning, everyone. <laughs> All right, let me see. So I think I did something a little different. I wrote something um, kind of going through my elementary, junior high, high school experience. And I think at the end, I'll go off strip for a little bit to talk about um, what's been happening recently. Uh, let me see. So I was born and raised in the church. How's the mic? <laughs> my dad was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Um, when, my, when I was six years old, my parents divorced, and my mom took my brother Coney and I from England all the way down here to Texas. So that was a difficult time for me. Um, we, started, we started attending the uh, Baptist church with my cousins, and eventually when I was able to see my dad on the weekends, there were disagreements on like what church my brother and I would be attending and where we'd, we'd be baptized and that kind of stuff. And even though they didn't intend it, religion kind of became a touchy subject for me when I was younger. Um, in late elementary school, I started to have doubts in my faith. Like, if the Bible is perfect, why do different denominations degree on things and can't seem to get the story straight? Can I believe that one guy built a giant ark that held two of every animal to rescue them from a worldwide flood? And how did the descendants of Noah reach other continents, like the Americas? Um, I had these doubts, and yet I always knew that like faith in God was incredibly important. I felt agonized that I was experiencing these doubts. All the time I found myself fervently praying to a God I wasn't even sure I believed in or not. Um, in 10th grade, one of my closest friends, Robin, invited me to attend church with her at Bear Creek Baptist, which meant more to me than she knows. And around the t same time, I was taking um, Mr. Kemper Crab's Humane Letters II class. Uh, we learned to discuss topics that I hadn't really, uh, I don't know, considered before, like spiritual forces and warfare, and how without God there are no, no standards of good and evil. Uh, this time was kind of a spiritual reawakening for me. I had bought my own Bible and was reading through it, and I was attending church almost every week, and I felt joy. I was so thankful to have a stronger relationship with Christ, but by the beginning of senior year of high school, however, I was feeling stuck again. I once again wasn't attending church often, and in trying to read straight through the Bible, I had gotten it stuck in Chronicles for a long time, and I was once again struggling with doubt. I wondered if God's promises and salvation were really so fragile that the moment I had an intrusive thought like, do you really believe in this stuff? My salvation would just be revoked. Was I losing and receiving salvation every few weeks? Was I never saved at all? I started listening to the live stream at New Church, uh, which at the time took place at my high school campus on Sundays. One of the first services of Pastor Frank's I listened to was exactly what I needed to hear to get past the spiritual roadblock I was struggling with for a really long time. He said that um, doubt, is, doubt is not the opposite of faith, but it is a prerequisite to faith. If you have no doubt, there is no need to be holding on to faith. Faith is, necessi faith is like necessary when you do not have 100% proof that something is true. Uh, I felt that a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Even if my mind is weak and has dumb, intrusive thoughts, I still, believe to, I, I still choose to believe in God anyway. Because the fact is, I need God. Without God, there is no purpose to life, no meaning, no hope, no love. And during times in my life when I act more distant to God, I feel mentally and spiritually sick. You know, it's amazing how that stuff correlates. When I spend time with God, and as Mr. Crab says it, read my freaking Bible, I feel healthy. I have a positive and happy outlook on life, myself, others, and reality. And when I neglect my relationship with God, I feel absolutely awful, worthless. You know, that stuff isn't a coincidence. Knowing that God exists, he has established absolute truths. He has established right and wrong, and he loves me and has a relationship with me. Even though I am obstinate and experience doubt sometimes, it's really incredibly freeing. Um, and I probably shouldn't spend too much time up here. I don't know how much time we have, but um, I don't know. I was really like sheltered in high school, and when I like graduated and... Uh, you know, was about to start college, I realized that, um, I don't know, all that stuff like, you know, drugs, sex, violence was like a lot closer to me than I realized. It wasn't just like the bad people doing that stuff far away or whatever. And so 
it was like kind of like a kind of a shock at first and it was like okay how do I like hold on to all my strengths and values when you know like um I don't know I have like friends who don't necessarily believe the thing, same things that I do for the most part I've been really fortunate and I have a really good foundation in the honors college at HBU and I've been really enjoying uh reading through books like Thomas Aquinas and Luther and that kind of things but I I guess I need to try to be an example more and maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to know what to do even when you're out of college. Should you stay in your bubble or should you try to be a good experience, uh, I don't know, example elsewhere? All I know is that um, one thing that has been, something I've just been thinking about with faith, which has been really powerful for me is, um, you know, humans, we don't really create anything. We take it, things from the world around us and we kind of change them in different ways. Like, we can't create curtain, but we can create, we can find a bunch of materials and tools and make a curtain from those things. And one thing I've been thinking about recently is where would people create purpose from? What materials would we create our sense of purpose from? Because all humans seem to have a need for that. And so it seems to me that that isn't something we can make ourselves. That purpose is something that already exists and that we see and make things out of that. So I don't know if I communicated that well, but I guess I've been finding recently that, you know, right and wrong and purpose are all needs that we inherently have and people all over the world are creating religions because they see a need for spirituality, for God. And yeah, that's just been very powerful for me. So yeah, thank you very much for your time. Um, have a great day. Hello, my name is Ryan Bersinger, and I teach the apologetics class here at New Church. And I wanted to sort of let you guys know what that kind of is. The idea of the apologetics class for the kids is to kind of help equip them to not only start to understand their faith, but also to understand where their faith comes from. Where, where this whole idea comes from, where, um, how to understand the Bible, how to, um, how to receive that faith, have it have context in their own lives, and how to share that with other people. And one of the things that happens to kids in high school and into college especially is there is an assault on their faith at that time. Um, it is something, sometimes it's very subtle, sometimes it's very direct and in their face, and a lot of kids who come from churches don't really know how to deal with that. They have kind of pat answers that they were given by their parents, the, what some people call the Sunday school answers, and they don't have um, real answers that they understand that they can give. They might be able to give a one-liner to somebody, but they can't have a conversation about it because they don't quite understand what they know. Here's one of the problems with this, and this is me looking back at myself too, is one of the ways that kids learn these things is from their parents. And a lot of times they learn these things, they notice their parents. They read, they try to understand things, but they're also watching. Because one of the things that kids are always wanting to do is they want to know the right way to do things. And the only people they have to look at is their parents. And they look at their parents and they go, they read something and they go, well, this says that I'm supposed to act this way in this situation. And then they just kind of look and they go, well, so what are my parents doing? Are my parents doing that? Oh, they're not doing that? So that must not mean very much. And then they don't bother to, to, to deal with it because they're like, it's not really real because I see reality of being an adult lived out by my parents. And that's a sobering thing because they're always watching. They've been watching. It's almost as if by the time they get into high school or into college, it's too late. They've already been watching you for 10, 15 years. They already know everything about you. And for a lot of us, that's scary, okay? 
And I know that for myself too. That's a scary thing is that, you know, you look at your kid and you go, man, what a knucklehead. And then you go, wait a minute, they're doing the same thing I'm doing. They're just mirroring it right back at me. Okay. So, so one of the ways that that's able to help is this apologetics class is to give them the ability to have conversations about these things. The good thing about this is, is that they will learn how to talk about their faith. They will learn how to ask questions. The problem with it for parents is, is they're going to start asking you this stuff. And so that's, that's actually very important because they're going to start asking you questions. The smarter your kids get, look out. This is something I tell my kids at school all the time. Look out when your kids start getting smarter. It's like in my class in eighth grade, I teach them how to argue. And then what they do is, is they try it out at home and see if it really works. And I get parents that will say, this is the best thing that's ever happened and the worst thing that's ever happened to me and my children because now they know how to argue and I'm rusty. Okay, because it's not a, you know, it's not a Facebook thing where you can just, you know, throw something out at somebody and then go hide from it and stuff. This is this kid coming back and asking you the same question again. Still don't understand. Still don't get it. You tell me this, but then I see you doing this. How does that match up? And then all of a sudden they've got you. So what I would like to say is, is that you should really have your kids take the apologetics class. It will help them in their growth, in, their, in, their, um, in the way that they think, because it'll help give them a lens for how to see the world. And also, it will also help them to have better communication with you about their faith, because they're going to start asking you questions. Now, what this means for you guys is, is that you guys, parents, me, everybody means y'all have to start boning up on stuff too because it is not going to get better right away. It's going to get better, but you're going to feel awkward and a little uncomfortable because they're going to start asking you big questions and things that you may not have thought about for a long time, some things you may have never thought about. But it's important because we're trying to build the kingdom of God. And in building the kingdom of God, we need everybody, not just the kids. We need the parents, the kids, everybody. So, uh, we have a Bible study that will be starting next week. So, be looking in the announcements for the times and the dates. Um, at this point, it's still going to be on Zoom, and once we're able to do Bible studies here, we'll have them here on ground um, before church starts. So, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we humans exist in three dimensions. You know, we were made in the image of God. And uh, Hebrews tells us that it's Christ who is the exact image of God. And uh, they're very cir circuitous argument. In the scripture, in point of fact, what we're being renewed into is the image of Christ. And Christ said... Once upon a time in John 14, 6, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by way of me. <clears throat> and it's interesting that he described himself in that way because we humans, um, normally we, uh, the questions, what we're looking for in life, fall in at least one of those categories and not only others. We're either looking for the way to God, you know, the way to arrange the circumstances around us or whatever so that we can find some way to what ultimately matters <clears throat> or the life. We want some sort of experience of reality within ourselves that lets us know all the things that make us human and experience of God. Or we want intellectual answers, right? How does all this stuff fit together? How does this mean anything uh, you know, intellectually and so forth. And of course, our society, sections of our society are, are very dedicated to that. <clears throat> but here's the deal. If we're being renewed into the image of God, then all three of those aspects need to be balanced in our lives. Because as you could tell from the testimonies that were given here, uh, and then all the kids talked about things in different ways, but all three of those dimensions 
what's going on around me, the way to God, what kind of experience of reality I have of God and so forth, and what I know about God are all important. And everybody's looking for a slightly different thing because we're all made slightly differently and we tend to predominate and one of those three things is more important to us than the others. So our lives themselves, to be a city on a hill, have got to display those aspects uh, in any given way because we, we don't ever know who we're going to meet, what they're looking for, and what it is about our lives that are going to testify to them that we truly do know the living God and that he's real and so forth and so on, right? I mean, the Bible says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. And most of the church is pretty good about hitting on the heart and soul or in strength part, but, but the mind thing is kind of weak. What uh, Ryan was talking about in teaching an apologetics course is um, the church in our day is not real strong on that. But of course, in order to begin to think right about God, you have to, I don't know how shall I say this, read your freaking Bible. <laughs> you know, because that's how we know what truth is. And, uh, you know, Frank and I wanted y'all to know that, you know, that, uh, that what we do matters, not only in our own lives, not only you as parents. And, you know, we've had imminent testimony here today of how families have affected these, these young people who've uh, stood up and talked about it. But even we as a congregation, what we're doing matters. You... You know, there's no way you can know all the stuff that's going on, even though we're a little church, right? God is at work in people's lives in a lot of different ways, and it's making a difference in the world outside of our small congregation. So one of the things I'd hoped would come from this is that, uh, as Ryan pointed out, hopefully this will make an impact on you, right? Hopefully your lives uh, can begin more consistently to be lived in terms of your faith instead of some compartmentalized thing where Christianity's over here and my, my job's over here and stuff. Christianity is not a compartment. Christianity for a Christian is the environment in which all the compartments fit. And we have to look at everything from the perspective of God. And we have to live in the way God wants us to. And we have to be the city on the hill. You know, we have to be the light in the darkness. Our culture, you may not have noticed, our culture is getting darker, right? That's the bad news. The good news is when it gets darker, light is brighter, right? And our goal is to drive away the darkness by being the light, by being the city on the hill, by being the candle that burns is not covered by a, a basket, right? So, um, you know, in thinking about that, let's, uh, let's confess in our song, as we normally do. Band, y'all come back. Uh, we will sing together our creed song. I don't know if y'all knew this, this, we believe in one God is a, actually a setting of the creed uh, that we sing every Sunday. That's why we sing it, because it sums up the basic beliefs of the faith. And uh, this is a good opportunity for y'all to confess your faith by singing, and uh, you'd memorized it and didn't even know you did. Our creed, it's us. 
time when we pray for the needs of our church and other churches across the world, knowing, uh, keeping in mind that this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And brothers and sisters, the first step, you know, in living out the Christian life is that you believe what he says. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, let us pray. O oh God, our maker and redeemer, you wonderfully created us and in the incarnation of your son, yet more wondrously restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him who made himself to be like us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. And we pray, Lord, that we would be cognizant of the fact that we are called to imitate Christ that we are called to be your image in the world. We ask that you would fill and enlighten us and, and cause us to, uh, with verve and gumption, live out the life that you've given us to live with the power that you've given us to do so. And Lord, we also uh, pray to you for the various needs. We pray for those uh, who are sick or having medical procedures. We lift up to you Rick and Laura and Ray and Angel and Bill and Michelle and Nikki's uncle and Wayne and Brooke and Grace and Pat and Delinda and other people who we lift up to you now. We lift up to you, Lord, those who are having relationship problems. We ask that you would be a reconciler and that you would knit together things uh, so that they have strength. We lift up to you those who need a job or who, who need money, and we ask that you would provide these things for them, that you who own everything would give to your people because of what Jesus has done. For those who are depressed or tired or sad, especially in this time of joy, we ask that you would be their joy, that you would reveal yourself more fully to them and draw them into your life. We also lift up to you Texas and the United States and our leaders, we pray that the hope of the gospel would be a light to this nation and through us to all the nations, that your kingdom would spread across the world. We pray for new church and your church throughout the world, that we would all be faithful in the mission that you have not only called us to do, but given us the power to do. And we left up to you the prayer, Lord, that if there's anybody here this morning who hasn't repented of their sin and confessed their need of Christ as Savior, we pray that they would hear the gospel today, turn from death and begin to walk in faith and in new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Now let us praise the Lord Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you. 
Thank you. Look at you sitting down so perfectly. Didn't even have it asked. That's awesome. Just, it's not quite Pavlov's dog, but I'll ring a bell. I can do that. Um, we always have a raw feed of the Sunday service that goes on like now. If you'd like to see the better service professionally developed in which my announcements will be edited and cut out, that comes up about 5 o'clock. So if something was said that uh, uh, brought you closer or you want to share with someone, that'll go online this afternoon around 5 o'clock. Uh, it's always great to see everyone. As always, we need help putting things away today. So uh, if, you, if you're, you're able to help and you're a member here, uh, do that. Uh, now, I love it when they give me a mic. This is so good. Um, for me, it's, I recognize it's not that great for you, but it's good for me. A couple of things real quickly before we go that I learned today and that are remembered. Um, Vaughn, Izzy, who I've known since they were two years old. Uh, Cassie, Jacob. Guys, a couple of years ago, I was without a job and I was driving to uh, my interview and a friend of mine was praying for me and it was the most... Uh, life-changing thing for me uh, first of all I didn't have a wreck I was praying over we driving that was awesome that then I wish I'd been told this at my age which was he prayed father help Lynn to go into the interview and to be the best version of himself that you created him to be I have a tendency to put too much pressure on myself or my beliefs that I've got to be something or I've got to be this way or that way or I've got to try to be the funniest guy in the room or the, the, the smartest guy in the room. And his prayer was, help Lynn to remember that you created him and his responsibility is to be who you created him to be. Dude, pressure off. I pray that same thing for you. The, the other thing is, this, five years ago, this church didn't exist. That's kind of weird. Think about it, isn't it? You existed. Church didn't exist. Frank and Kemper and Ryan have known each other for years, and I think God has anointed this church through those people, through the experience that they had in their lifetime. Yes, you too, Chris. And as we love each other and move in this church, understand how important you are to this spot. You didn't just happen to be here. I mean, it's a Sunday after Christmas, for God's sake. You know, there, there's a Gary-sized hole in this church that only Gary can fill. And, there, and there's a Frank-sized hole that only Frank can fill. And there's, you know, there's a Huck-sized hole that only Huck can fill. We love you. 
And thank you for making my life better and for making this time of year better. Let's go get 2021 together, all right? No, this isn't where I pray. This is where we leave. Y'all can go now. Awesome. Have a great week. Love you guys.